So over the next month, a month and a half, the Fort Sumter situation plays out, you know? Um, Anderson sends a letter saying, hey, we're running out of supplies here. If by about April 15th, I'm going to have to surrender the fort because we'll just have no food left or anything like that. Meanwhile, Seward is negotiating with Virginia. The Virginia Secession Convention has voted against secession but remained meeting and sent delegations to negotiate with Seward to see what kind of concessions could be made. At one point, Seward seemed to have made a deal with them that if the Virginia Secession Convention dissolved, Lincoln would abandon Fort Sumter. Lincoln supposedly said, a fort for a state is a pretty good bargain. But that didn't happen for one reason or another. And um, Seward is meanwhile, who is of course appointed as Secretary of State, Seward is the Secretary of State now under Lincoln, is battling, there's a battle for control. Seward kind of thought he would run the administration. It would be like in England where you had, you've got a king, or back then a queen, Queen Victoria, and a prime minister who really runs the government, right? Lincoln would be the king, the titular head of state, and Seward, the secretary of state, would really operate the government. And on April 1st, Seward sent a memo to Lincoln, an odd memo, saying, the administration has no policy and I am prepared to take over, if you wish. <laughs> and I, here's my policy. I got a policy. Here's my policy. Here's my policy. We must deflect attention away from this crisis by creating another crisis. You know, it's like how they set a fire to try to stop a forest fire. What is the crisis? Declare war on Spain. <laughs> well, not so, not so fast. Seems kind of crazy. Declare war on Spain, northerners and southerners will join in fighting against Spain and that'll bring the country back together. It's obviously ridiculous except for one little thing. What would you be declaring war with Spain over? <laughs> Cuba. In other words, what this is about is the north will seize Cuba before the south gets it. Unless the south comes along, they're not going to let us do it by themselves. They're going to join up. And in order to get Cuba from Spain, the South will rejoin the Union. So it's cleverer than one might think, although Lincoln said, hey, we've got enough problems here without starting a war here. Um, Lincoln wrote back in a very mild manner saying, you are mistaken. We do have a policy. It's my policy. And if any other policy has to be adopted, I am the one who will implement it. In other words, telling Seward, I am in control here, not you. Well. To make a long, complicated story short, and there are books about just the two or three weeks about Fort Sumter, uh, before Fort Sumter, um, Lincoln has to decide, in early April, he finally decides he's got to, he can't abandon the fort, he's got to send supplies or something down there to, for these men. Um, meanwhile, the Confederacy has, augura has inaugurated its own government. Jefferson Davis of Mississippi is the president of the Confederacy. Davis orders or instructs Governor Pickens of South Carolina, under no circumstances are you to allow provisions to be sent to Sumter. Or in other words, fire. If so Lincoln very cleverly, if this is the way you want to look at it, publicly announces that he's sending these ships. This is what you would call today in war situations humanitarian aid. No guns, no weapons. I am sending food to starving soldiers. How can that be a threat to the Confederacy? How can that be a threat to South Carolina? They're sitting on an island in Charleston Harbor. They're not bothering anybody. How can anyone object? They're going to starve if, they, if, they, if they're not supplied. Lincoln knew very well what was going to happen. It had happened when the Star of the West was fired upon three months earlier. He put the Confederacy in the position of either allowing the fort to be resupplied and thereby sort of acknowledging federal authority there, or firing the first shot, firing the first shot. Lincoln does not want to be the one who inaugurates war put the onus on the Confederacy to decide whether there's going to be peace or war. Well, Lincoln announces this. The Confederates say it's not acceptable. And then they say, well, why wait? There were like three or four ships. 
One of them may be a warship. Why wait to fight the fort and ships? So they start bombarding the fort right away. They demand Anderson surrender. Anderson refuses to surrender. They begin firing on Fort Sumter on April, uh, on April 12th. And two days later, Anderson surrenders, because there's nothing he can do with cannon fire raining down and he got no supplies. When the ships finally arrive, all they can do is evacuate the soldiers, which they do. They fly in, they sail in, they evacuate the troops. Anderson is a hero in the North. Fortunately for him, it was only after the war that, his, that a letter of his was made public earlier on advising Lincoln to surrender the fort. But uh, nobody knew he had done that at the time. So let's, um, here we go. This is the beginning of the Civil War, folks, the bombardment of Fort Sumter. There's the Confederate batteries in Charleston. There's Fort Sumter out there in the harbor getting fired upon. Um, I don't actually know if anyone, I don't know if anyone was actually killed in the bombardment of Fort Sumter. Um, but anyway, this is the beginning of the Civil War. Why, how do you interpret Lincoln's actions? Well, you name it, whether, you, you look, there are historians giving you every position you might want. Charles Ramsdell, Southerner. To save his party and his, his administration, Lincoln ruthlessly inaugurated a war for political reasons, maneuvering the Confederacy into the position of firing the first shot. David Potter, Lincoln took the least warlike stance possible under the circumstance. There was no reason for the Confederacy to fire. The onus lies on them, not on Lincoln. Kenneth Stamp, Lincoln hoped for peace, was willing to accept war, sort of knew the possibility of war, set up a situation where he'd win either way. All these interpretations are explaining the same course of events. It's really the point of view of the historian. If you're sympathetic to the Confederacy, you see Lincoln as a conspirator in inaugurating the war. If you're sympathetic to Lincoln, you see the Confederacy for no reason inaugurating the war with the first shot. But nonetheless, it is the beginning of the war, and immediately then Lincoln declares a state of insurrection in the South calls for 75,000 volunteers to join the Union Army at this time. It's like 18,000 men. 75,000 volunteers. We'll talk about that soon. And four more states secede. Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas. The next level up of the southern states now secede with the call for troops. Those are the green states there. The very upper slave states, and we'll talk about this never secede. They remain in the Union. But now 11 of the 15 slave states are in the Confederacy. Some people think Davis ordered the firing on Fort Sumter in order to force Virginia into the Confederacy, in order to force them, in order to start a war where they would have to choose sides. Um, so now there is a united South, almost a united South. And what is it that holds those states of the Confederacy together from Virginia south? It's not cotton, it's slavery. It is slavery that now is the, the, found, the actual real foundation of unity in the, in the Confederacy. With the, the war, the beginning of war forces Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas to decide what are we? Are we slave states or are we states in the National Union? The upper, upper South states, where slavery is much, much weaker, stay in, uh, in, in the Union. Um, so what was the cause of the Civil War? Well, uh, we could discuss this in our sections, right? Um, maybe irrepressible conflict versus blundering generation is not the right dichotomy. Maybe the right dichotomy is how you explain historical events by weighing the import of contingency versus structure. Contingency versus structure. In other words, accidents, individual decisions, lo local events versus social forces, broad interpretive you know, explanations. How do, you, how do you balance that? Karl Marx explained this once where he said, men, and we would add women today, men make their own history, but they do not make it in circumstances of their own choosing. Right? 
The circumstances are not the result of any individual person. But Lincoln's decision, Davis's decision, absolutely. One can trace out individual decisions, but that's not the broadest way of looking at the war. Could war have been avoided in 1861? Absolutely. It's certainly possible to imagine scenarios of compromise. They had compromised in 1820. They had compromised in 1832. They had compromised in 1850. Could have been a compromise. Why not? Would that have solved the underlying division between two societies based on two different systems of labor? Probably not. Could another way have been found of ridding the country of slavery? I would hope so, but I have never yet seen a plausible scenario for achieving that goal, unfortunately. So, but these are philosophical questions as much as, um, as historical questions. So let me just end by showing you one of my favorite pictures from this period. Here's a young girl right at this time gazing at a portrait of George Washington, a patriotic photograph from around 1860. Washington, the creator of the nation, um, but the nation created by the Founding Fathers now lay in ruins. And out of the Civil War, a new nation, not the old nation, a new nation would be created. And with it, of course, a new birth of freedom, as Lincoln would call it. So next time, we'll start looking at how that process happened. <laughs> <laughs>